questions that have gone unanswered. Why was Elvis involved in government undercover operations? Why did Elvis use the pseudonym John Burroughs? And who is the man using that name today? If this is Elvis, then who is this? Elaborate hoax or monumental cover-up? Thorough investigation, handwriting, and voice analysis are all used to trace the truth in the Elvis Conspiracy, next on CFCF 12. The following program contains recreations that dramatize the events surrounding the mysterious death of Elvis Presley. The program also contains interviews with some of the actual people involved in these events. August 16th, 1977, paramedics arrive at Graceland and try to revive what appears to be the corpse of Elvis Presley. They are unsuccessful, and the man is pronounced dead. The world mourns the passing of Elvis, but others begin to question the official story of his death, and the mystery begins. August 14th, 1991, millions of people around the nation watch the broadcast of The Elvis Files, a program detailing the startling charges that Elvis Presley is not dead. Thousands of people contact the program, some of them with information that supports the Elvis Files' ultimate conclusion, that Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, may still be alive. Now, The Elvis Conspiracy is being broadcast nationwide and presents more history in the remaking. My name is Kelly Wadsworth. On August 23rd of 1991, I saw Elvis Presley at Winesburg Inn in Clyde, Ohio. These people believe they have seen Elvis Presley after the day he allegedly died. All of them might not be telling the truth, but if only one is correct, then Elvis Presley might still be alive. Do you know who I am? Have Music experts support the claim that this record was recorded by Elvis Presley. Wait a minute, man, wait a minute, hold on. Somebody just told me that uh, President Reagan and, uh, and some other people have been shot. Yet this record was recorded in 1981. Could Elvis Presley still be recording under the name Sybil Nora? One of two things is going to happen. Either a man simply by the name of John Burroughs lives at this address, or the king has been here in hiding since 1977. Monty Nicholson is an investigator for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. He has followed a paper trail of credit statements across the country that he believes may lead straight to Elvis Presley. And the last transaction was made in March of 1991. This letter was mailed in September of 1991 by a man who signed himself John Burroughs. Handwriting analysis suggests that Elvis Presley could have written it. I found that there are about 80% similarity between the two handwritings. He's been accustomed by the uh, growing beers and, and this and that to, to keep from being recognized. Some claim that this is the voice of Elvis Presley. Others claim that these tapes are merely a clever fraud. On the Elvis conspiracy, we'll put these tapes to the ultimate test. Joe Esposito was Elvis Presley's road manager and chief of staff. Larry Geller was his friend and spiritual advisor. Now, for the first time, they'll tell us what really happened on the day that Elvis Presley died. All American Communications, in association with PBI, presents The Elvis Conspiracy. Hosted by Bill Bixby. Now, from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, and the Legends in Concert showroom, our host, Bill Bixby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, what can I say? Welcome, and I cannot tell you how surprised I am to be on this stage again, uh, certainly so soon after our last program. I thought that after the uh, broadcast of the Elvis Files last August, we had presented a pretty comprehensive picture of the mysterious events swirling around the death of Elvis Presley. But our first show seemed to raise more questions than it answered, and it seemed somehow to touch a nerve across the country. Our phone poll showed that 79% of the over 50,000 calls that we received believe that Elvis Presley could be alive, 79%. Letters by the thousands poured in from people across the country who wanted to know more about what we have now come to call the Elvis Conspiracy. And this program is our response. Once again, we're going straight to the heart of the controversy. Joining us are people who can speak to this issue, and for the next two hours, 
I plan on guiding you through a fascinating, illuminating, and occasionally shocking story that will lead us, hopefully, to an answer. Did Elvis Presley really pass away on August 16, 1977? With us are some men and women who have been deeply involved in exploring this mystery. Monty Nicholson is a sheriff's investigator who believes he might either have tracked Elvis Presley across the country or uncovered a bizarre conspiracy. Joining us later on will be Joe Esposito, a man who is certain he knows what really happened to Graceland in August of 1977, and he should know he was there. Larry Geller was one of Elvis's closest friends and confidants. He felt that he could no longer remain silent with what he knows to be the truth about Elvis Presley, and he's decided to share his story with us tonight. This photograph was taken on September 23rd, 1984. It shows Muhammad Ali being checked out of a hospital in New York City. Now we showed you this picture in our last broadcast for one reason. Elvis's stepbrother, Billy Stanley, identified the man standing in the background of this photograph as Elvis. We're gonna take a short break, and when we return, we're gonna positively clear up the mystery of just who is in this startling picture. So stay with us. Who is John Burroughs? Coming up, dramatic evidence suggesting that Burroughs might actually be Elvis Presley. Evidence that leads to the inescapable conclusion that Elvis may still be alive. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. Those of you who were with us on our first program know that we presented a great deal of information and one of the most fascinating pieces of evidence we examined is this photograph which some people believe shows Elvis Presley in the company of his longtime friend Muhammad Ali. Jesse Jackson was also present. Now curiously, this picture was taken in 1984, seven years after Elvis allegedly died. Who was the man in the picture? One week after the Elvis Files aired, we got a call from a gentleman named Larry Kolb, who identified himself as Muhammad Ali's agent. Larry has joined us and has something to share with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Kolb. All right, Larry, welcome. And who is the man in that picture? That's me. Ah. And how did you happen to be in the photograph? I had checked Muhammad Ali into Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York two or three days before that picture was taken in September 1984. Uh -huh. I checked him in under an assumed name. Um, he was undergoing testing for Parkinson's disease under the auspices of one of the leading specialists in the world on Parkinson's disease. Uh -huh. And um, inevitably, somebody leaked to the press that he was in the hospital. So within hours, there were hundreds of reporters outside. And the next morning, two-inch high headlines in the papers in New York and across America saying, Ali in fight for his life, Ali near death. Yeah. And um, there were fans holding candlelight vigils outside the hospital. So I went upstairs to Ali and suggested that he better go downstairs. and see the people and let him know that he was okay because he was upstairs having a good time and not Enjoyed really very sick at all oh yeah he loved the mystery and the controversy though and he didn't want to go downstairs and let the cat out of the bag so yeah. um finally it was six weeks before the presidential election in 1984 and when jesse jackson came to visit muhammad i suggested the two of them should go downstairs and announce that they were going to run for president together yes so um they couldn't resist that and they went downstairs and saw the people in the elevator on the way down um, i wanted to rile ali up a little bit more so i asked which of the two of them was going to be vice president and uh what what happened how was that decision made muhammad put his fist up to jesse and the good reverend got religion and decided he should be vice president i see a vice presidential uh, thing there yes all right but i noticed that you said it was at a new york hospital and we have been given to understand that this photo was from kalamazoo uh, the picture was definitely taken in New York. Well, we were also under the impression that Muhammad Ali had confirmed that it was Elvis in the photograph. If he did, he was certainly joking. 
All right. Now, our photograph was from a newspaper, but I understand that you have the color version of the original photograph. Can we show that to the audience? Sure. All right. Now, this is the color version of the original photograph, and when you look at it and see it with all of its colors and all of its fullness, yeah, it could look a little bit like Elvis, but I can see that it's, it's really you. But now you have a black and white version, the newspaper version of the same photograph. Right. Now, when you start removing some of the details in here and some of the fill and you get into the hard black and white colors, you'll notice that this takes on much more of a potential resemblance to Elvis Presley, the newspaper picture. I understand uh, there's something written on the back, I was told. Right. When I showed the videotape of your first show to Muhammad and this picture to him, he wrote you a little poem. Muhammad wrote me a poem. Oh, a warning. A warning? <laughs> yeah. Elvis was the coolest, without a doubt. If you say this chump Larry is Elvis, then I'll knock you out to Muhammad Ali. Well, <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not going to say that you're Elvis, but I am going to thank you very, very much for being here and sharing this time with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and for straightening out the misconception, too. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, now, our intention tonight is to clear up as much of the mystery surrounding Elvis's alleged death as we can, no matter what conclusion it supports. Now, before we get much further, I think we should give you a recap of what we discussed on our last show. In essence, here was the possible scenario that we examined last August. It has been suggested that on August 16th, 1977, Elvis Presley arranged things to look like he had died. A longtime undercover government agent, Presley had become embroiled in an FBI sting operation directed at a criminal organization known as the Fraternity. Fearful for his life and his family's safety, Elvis Presley carefully staged his own death. He accomplished this by somehow planting either a wax dummy or another body at Graceland, and by securing the cooperation of local officials in covering up the trail that might have led to the truth. It has been alleged that Elvis Presley left Graceland by helicopter the very same afternoon he was reported dead. An important clue that Elvis Presley is not buried at Graceland is that his middle name, Aaron, was misspelled with two A's on his tombstone. Allegedly, Elvis then moved to a secret location, perhaps in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the Midwest, or Hawaii. Presley has maintained a low profile ever since, but has been tape recorded at least twice, once in a late night phone call to Gail Brewer Giorgio. Well, maybe you'll be a grandfather one of these days. Elvis Presley was also allegedly recorded in a longer conversation with a woman named Ellen Foster in 1981. I started traveling all over the world, and it's been, uh, it's been enjoyable, but it's, it's been a constant battle of uh, growing beards and, and this and that to, to keep from being recognized. Some believe and hope that Elvis Presley will soon come out of hiding and explain to the world the real circumstances of his disappearance. All right. As with many conspiracy theories, proof for the Elvis conspiracy is very elusive. We know for a fact that Elvis Presley had received a DEA, uh, uh, received a DEA appointment as a special assistant to the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs by President Richard M. Nixon and was given a badge. We also know that he had unknowingly become a victim of an organized crime conspiracy to defraud him of a large sum of money and that the criminal group known as the Fraternity became the target of an FBI sting operation in part because of this conspiracy. And as we all know, for the last few years, there have been a number of Elvis sightings all around the country. Now, after the airing of our first special, we were swamped by people with their own sighting stories to tell. We were skeptical, but we did check them out. And most all of the sightings fell apart under scrutiny. But in a few cases, we couldn't ignore what these witnesses had to say. 
So throughout the course of this broadcast, we're going to bring you their stories in their own words so that you can decide for yourself. For example, Is Elvis Presley alive? Our first sighting took place in August of 1991 in Clyde, Ohio. My name is Kelly Wadsworth. On August 23rd of 1991, I saw Elvis Presley at Winesburg Inn in Clyde, Ohio. When we heard Kelly's statement, we sent investigators to Clyde, Ohio, and the location of the sighting, the Winesburg Inn. Kelly Wadsworth is certain that Elvis Presley had dinner there, and she believes that she has the photographs to prove it. On the night of August 23rd, 1991, at approximately 6 p.m., Kelly and her boyfriend observed a man fitting Elvis's description, exiting a car that was suspiciously parked in the back of the restaurant. And I said, God, this guy really looks like him. I said, we've got to go home and get the camera and take some pictures. Nobody's going to believe me. A few minutes later, Kelly returned with the camera. I checked in the lobby. Nobody was there. I looked in the bar side, nobody was there, and then that's when I spotted him. He was sitting in the restaurant. When I took my first picture and the click went off, I shocked him off. The bodyguard ran towards me and then he ran around the side and grabbed the stuff from the table. And then they started running out to the back door. I thought, maybe I can get a couple more good shots. What is very strange to me is if this wasn't Elvis, then why was he getting up in a hurry after I took a picture? In fact, the bodyguard even came towards me to keep me from taking another shot. I never dreamed this was gonna happen. At the restaurant, we talked with hostess Chris Davidson about Kelly's sighting. Chris remembered the incident and described the mysterious man. He had dark, real dark, was this man? We do know that he made a reservation under the name of John Burroughs. Besides that, his identity and whereabouts today is unknown. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, we'll follow a mysterious paper trail that may lead straight to Elvis Presley. Welcome back to the Elvis conspiracy. A few minutes ago, we brought you the story of Kelly Wadsworth, an Ohio woman who believes that she may have seen Elvis. Last August, no matter what you believe, there was one part of Kelly's story that intrigued us, and that is this. Now, during the course of researching this broadcast, we've come across this name many times. Our next guest will share with us the results of his investigation, which makes the name John Burroughs a name to be reckoned with. Joining us is Monty Nicholson, an investigator for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and the author of two books, The Presley Arrangement and Elvis Calling. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Monty Nicholson. All right, now, uh, Monty, your investigation into the controversy regarding Elvis Presley's death began as a novel, didn't it? Yeah, Bill, it really did. It was my intention from the very beginning to write novels, fiction novels, that would immortalize Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Of course, as I researched that information, I got caught up in this controversy. Yes. But you know, I think the most interesting thing I've seen of everything is this paper trail of John Burroughs. All right, let's share some of that investigation now. A week or two after the Elvis Files aired, I received a call from a gentleman with an amazing story to tell. This man was something of a computer hacker. Intrigued by our show, he tried to track down Elvis Presley's credit report. He typed in the name and found nothing. He tried again, only this time, he typed in Elvis's social security number. Bingo! Up came some information, and next to Elvis's number was a second number. 
When he typed in that number, up came the name Elvis Presley. Curiously, another name also appeared, John Burroughs. John Burroughs' name was woven together with Elvis Presley's throughout this lengthy credit report. This was just the beginning. Well, it appears that Elvis Presley or someone using that name has a very active credit history since 1977 when he supposedly died. Now, usually when a person dies, their credit history is wiped out after seven years. Isn't that correct? That's Mark? correct. It appears that someone is actively using Elvis Presley's credit history as late as March of 1991. Now, what do you mean by using? Well, someone appears to be taking Elvis Presley's Social Security number, or the number that's uh, assigned to John Burroughs, mm -hmm. and is using them in a series of financial transactions. Now, our information doesn't explain what kind of transactions these are, but the fact that somebody's using them is pretty curious and maybe criminal. All right, then where does John Burroughs fit in? Well, it's highly unlikely that John Burroughs and Elvis Presley's credit history could overlap if they're two distinct individuals. Mm -hmm. This John Burroughs uh, may be in violation of the law, unless, of course, he is Elvis Presley. Now, take a look at this. Our paper trail begins with an entry that shows John Burroughs living in Fort Worth, Texas in December of 1989. It then leads to Kalamazoo, Michigan where John Burroughs had another residence. This paper trail also revealed that John Burroughs had applied for credit in Little Rock, Arkansas, Birmingham, Alabama, Shreveport, Louisiana, and Kansas City, Missouri. Continuing along this trail, we uncovered a new address for John Burroughs in Perrysburg, Ohio, and most recently in Chicago, Illinois. But the curious thing about this paper trail is that it begins in Memphis, Tennessee. Monty? Where in Memphis? One of the addresses was Graceland. So you're telling us that John Burroughs lives at Graceland? That's what the file appeared to show. One of the former addresses was Graceland, yes. All right, what explanation do you have for this? Well, I believe there's three theories. One, Elvis Presley's alive. Two, uh, someone's concocted this entire thing in order to keep the rumor afloat. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, this thing's all a smokescreen to lead us to believe we've solved the mystery and throw us off the trail. Uh, sometime late December, mm -hmm. uh, I went on the road with another investigator uh, trying to track down uh, this elusive John Burroughs and follow up on some of the uh, more credible Elvis sightings. Uh, why don't we just go ahead and run that now and, I'll, and it'll explain. All right. Recently, a man named David Wasson got a letter written by a John Burroughs postmark in Fort Worth, Texas. It had a return address, so that's where we started. Now, this paper trail has led us to this rather obscure area in Texas. Now, we haven't gone to the house yet. That will be our next step. Understand that you are watching this as it happens. We don't know what to expect. What you've been looking at is a house that a person by the name of John Burroughs lives. I'm pretty skeptical at this point looking at the neighborhood, but one of two things is going to happen. Either a man simply by the name of John Burroughs lives at this address, or the king has been here in hiding since 1977. And you watch it and go with me now as we contact the people that live there and see what they can tell us about John Burroughs. When we went to the house, it was empty, but we met a woman who spoke to us on the condition that we not show her face. She told us some intriguing things about John Burroughs. John is a businessman? Yeah. I thought you said he was an entertainer. Well, he is, but I mean, he's got a lot of businesses or something. I don't know. He's got a lot of business. Well, now let me ask you this question. You're aware of the controversy yeah. that, that Elvis may still be alive. Yeah. How do you feel about John Burroughs? Do you think there's a possibility that he could be the king in hiding? What's he look like? Elvis. He does look like Elvis, huh? How old, how old a man is he, would you say? Uh, I don't know. He's supposed to be 50. John Burroughs, from what you told me, you don't have any pictures of him. He, as soon as he found that someone was looking into his identity, he's moved. Uh, by your statements, he's in hiding. That he does 
doesn't want to be found, he doesn't want to be interviewed. And really, basically, you're saying that there's not a lot that you can talk about. The last thing the woman told us was that Burroughs had recently moved to Perrysburg, Ohio. The lady I talked to was very hesitant about talking to me about John Burroughs. She says he's a man that uh, wants to be in hiding. He's a man that does not want to be known as Elvis Presley. I ask why John Burroughs will not return my phone calls, will not allow me to interview him. If he indeed is not Elvis Presley, that would certainly dispel the rumor. All right, Monty, where did John Burroughs move? The woman told us that he'd moved to Perrysburg, Ohio, several months before we arrived. Coincidentally, that's in an area where a number of the so-called Elvis sightings have occurred. All right, where does this paper trail finally end up? Well, the most recent address is Chicago, Illinois. We ran an address update uh, from the existing paper trail, and that report came back with an additional name and new address. The address was in Chicago, and the name, curiously, was Presley. Well. When we return, we're going to explore the origins of the mysterious Mr. John Burroughs and try to give him a personal call. So stay with us. Is Elvis Presley alive? Our second sighting took place in late December 1989 in Crown Blanc, Michigan. It was the holiday season, and a celebration was in full swing. To a woman we will call Cindy, it was a Christmas she would never forget. Near the end of her shift, working at a local bar, Cindy was saying goodnight to some regular customers when she noticed a man sitting alone. There was something about him that seemed somehow familiar. Intrigued, she tried to engage him in conversation. Cindy said that though the light concealed the man's face, she became more and more certain she had seen him before. Somehow the conversation turned to entertainment, and the man told Cindy that one of his best friends was singer Tom Jones. Somewhat skeptical, Cindy finally finished up her conversation and went to turn on a bar light. Then she realized who the man was, but it was too late. For by the time she looked back, the man was gone. Later, two men reported seeing the man entering a stretch limo outside. Cindy is convinced the man was Elvis Presley. When we come back, we'll probe the identity of the mysterious John Burroughs, a name that brought Elvis Presley to the White House. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Just who is John Burroughs? There are many clues and theories. The name John Burroughs first appeared on a letter Elvis Presley wrote to President Richard Nixon in 1970. Presley told the president that he was using the name John Burroughs as a pseudonym in order to avoid public scrutiny. Then, seven years after Elvis Presley supposedly died, John Burroughs' name suddenly reappears. Curiously, a few months before the Elvis Files aired, a gentleman in Kingman, Arizona named David Wasson held a workshop on Elvis and a class that led to a correspondence between Mr. Wasson and John Burroughs. We recently filmed an interview with David Wasson and here is his story. In June of 1991, two months before the Elvis Files aired, a college teacher in Kingman, Arizona, David Wasson, hosted a four-day intensive workshop on the life of Elvis Presley and his contributions to American culture and the world of music. And some of the panel from our show participated in the workshop. In late August, after the Elvis Files was broadcast, Monty Nicholson contacted David, and together they agreed that he write a letter to the address of Mr. John Burroughs. Now, David, could you give me a little background on the John Burroughs letter? After the, um, the TV show last August, Monty received you mean the a, Elvis file. Right. Yeah. Monty received a, um, a tip that uh, John Burroughs, a name that Elvis at one time had gone by, was living in a certain state. And there was a connection between his name and Elvis Presley. And so we decided that I would write Mr. Burroughs a letter. Now, John Burroughs responded to your letter. Yes, he did. Uh, what did he write? I have a copy right here. Mm -hmm. 
He wrote, Dear Mr. Watson, I have received your letter and the info on Elvis. I'm sorry that I cannot meet you. I'm an entertainer and I'll be out of state during that time. I believe that you have a good idea on a living history on Elvis. Respectfully, John Burroughs. Now, what did you do when you, uh, when you received this letter? First thing I did, I grabbed my history books and looked up some samples of Elvis' handwriting, and I was quite impressed. This was very, very close. Yes, yeah, so am I. <laughs> well, what's your opinion now? Either there's someone out there who really has a lot of fun pretending he's Elvis Presley, uh -huh. has mastered the handwriting very well, or Elvis was very nice to send me a letter. Nice to send you a letter and then evaporate. Right. A lot of disappearances going on. But very few people get letters from Elvis today. So I'm they really feel privileged. But an awful lot of people see him, don't <laughs> they? They sure do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, when I saw the Wasson letter for the first time, my first thought was, yes, that looks like Elvis Presley's handwriting. But the letter could easily have been traced from the authenticated Elvis Presley letter to President Nixon. We contact, contacted, rather, handwriting expert Sheila Lowell and had her make a scientific comparison of these two documents, and here is her conclusion. In my capacity as a question document examiner qualified by the California court systems, I was asked to compare a handwriting of Elvis Presley in a letter that he wrote to President Richard Nixon with a letter that contains the name John Burroughs. And during my examination, I compared the two samples of handwriting for the stroke quality, the writing impulse, degree of slant, and many other facets of handwriting. I also made overhead transparency so that I could make a direct comparison of the writing style. This is the letter to Richard Nixon. I'm going to show you the letter from John Burroughs, and notice the word dear, mister, as I overlay this on top and you see how they match almost exactly. Both words, dear and mister. Also the word John Burroughs, which this letter was signed, John Burroughs, was in this letter to Richard Nixon. And as I overlay this, you'll see that these two are very, very similar. They have this, a space from the B to the rest of the word, the word John is written all in one impulse. The spacing between the two words is the same. And there are many, many similarities. The syntax in the two letters is also similar. Many of the same phrases and words were used. So what I did was to take the words that were the same in both letters and cut them out and paste them on a paper. And here they are for comparison. On this transparency, each of the top lines is the handwriting of Elvis. And the second line is the writing that was in the John Burroughs letter. The next thing that I did in my comparison was to prepare a psychogram chart on both handwritings. And the psychogram is a scientific instrument that was devised in the 1930s by a Dr. Clara Roman, who was a Hungarian psychiatrist. Here's the psychogram of Elvis Presley. And um, this is prepared by measuring over 40 different indicators in the handwriting. This is the psychogram of John Burroughs. And you'll see, as I lay one over the top of the other, that they are, again, almost identical. Having done this comparison, checking the slant, the size, the writing impulse, the stroke quality, and all of these other factors, I found that there are about 80% similarity between the two handwritings. But there's a 20% difference that is extremely important. And one of those differences is that in Elvis's writing, he consistently has what is called flame-shaped loops, which would be a loop that's pointed on the top, a feature that's missing in the John Burroughs letter. So in my professional opinion, having considered all these factors, I believe that the two handwritings were done by two different people. If Elvis Presley didn't write this letter, then who did? Now, before we went to Fort Worth, Monty Nicholson called the phone number that he had managed to get for John Burroughs. All right, Monty, what happened when you called it? Well, I spoke to a man at the Burroughs residence. Uh, his name was Ron. He identified himself, uh, identified himself as a house guest. Uh -huh. He gave a description of John Burroughs, which matched Elvis Presley's. Uh, this conversation took place on August 18, 1991, by the way, and John Burroughs was seen 
at the Winesburg Inn on August 23rd, just five days later. When we visited the address later, neither Ron nor John Burroughs were home. Oh, well. Monty has spoken with people at John Burroughs' Fort Worth address on several occasions, and now we are going to call again. Monty, if you'd like to come over here. Hopefully we will disguise this tone so that we do not expose the telephone number nationally. I misdialed. I will start again. Live television. Hmm. I know this one is right. Thank you very much for calling. We're not in at the present time. At the sound of the beep, please leave your name and number, and we'll get right back with you. Thank you. Right, this is a message for John Burroughs from Monty Nicholson. We are live on television. If you would like to comment on the Elvis conspiracy, please give us a call at 1-900-740-0401. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Well, That's right. all right, since we're in the phone calls, we would like to take some from you at home. All right? Our first call, we have Tom from Philadelphia. Hello, Tom. Is it possible that Elvis Presley is actually disguised as Howard Stern? As Howard Stern? Yes. That's two shows in a row you're trying to get publicity for yourself. So we'll move to the next caller. Thank you. May we have a call? <laughs> from Dave in St. Louis. Hello, Dave. Steve at DC on uh, Q106.5 had mentioned one time that uh, Joe Esposito, and I'd like your opinion on this, was paid off handsomely as uh, were, I think, a couple other people, the nurse that actually uh, saw Elvis the night he was brought in, and one other person that, that uh, escapes my memory. I'd like your opinion on that. Do you know anything of this? We, we've investigated a lot of those uh, types of preposterous allegations, and there's really no merit to those allegations at all. All right. Charlie from Massachusetts. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Bill. Hi. First of all, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. And... <laughs> Thank you. Uh... <laughs> my, qu Thank you. my question is this. Yeah. Uh, the name that Elvis supposedly recorded under that it was supposed to be his name backwards has anything been released under that name and what was the name again hmm i don't know that anything was released under that we are going to deal with this issue later do you know have any information with regard to that there was nothing released that i'm aware of but we are going to give information later so on. perhaps you could call back or maybe it will uh you know expose itself as we pursue this show now, throughout this program, we've tried to document all of the curious events that we discussed in our last broadcast. In the Elvis Files, we brought you the story of Kelly Burgess, a Detroit woman who claimed to have seen Elvis Presley in a Kalamazoo office building. Kelly Burgess has since passed away, but she was not alone that day, and we have managed to find the person with whom she shared this unsettling experience. When we come back, Jason Woolbright, Kelly's son, will tell us his first-hand version of the story, so stay with us. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, Elvis's closest friends and advisors present their side of the story and describe the Elvis you may never have known existed. Welcome back to the Elvis conspiracy. Now, there have been many sightings of Elvis Presley reported all over the country. And we've seen there have been a series of encounters in Ohio, what Monty Nicholson calls the epicenter of Elvis sightings. Now, right now, we want to reinvestigate one of the stories we brought you in our first broadcast. <laughs> Elvis Presley alive? Our third sighting took place in August of 1988 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. 
Kelly Burgess was intrigued with reports of Elvis sightings in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and in the summer of 1988, decided to investigate firsthand. Tipped off that John Burroughs, the mysterious owner of a local office building, resembled Elvis Presley, Kelly decided to go to the building and see for herself. Kelly has since passed away, but on a talk show, she described what she saw. I went into the offices, I went into four offices asking for Elvis Presley or John Burroughs. They all looked at me quite incredible. I mean, these business people, and I'm asking for Elvis Presley. Kelly continued to check out the building until she was intercepted by security personnel and ushered into an office. And there, Kelly believes that she saw Elvis Presley. I turned around and I looked directly into his eyes. He had on gold rimmed glasses, a very modified version of what he used to wear. And they were with a slight tint to him. But I looked in his eyes. I mean, he had the Elvis Presley expression in his eyes, which I think most people that knew him are familiar with. I mean, that, that kind of sparkle. The same, uh, same shape eyes, same color eyes. And I was, again, I was stunned. And I said, you have eyes just like Elvis. I said, are you a relative? He said, nope. Then, after he listened to, to my questions, just stood there, kind of, with a, a very pleasant look on his face, kind of half smiling at times. And just before I walked away, he said, yeah, but it's against the law to hoax your death. Now, as intriguing as Kelly's story was, we needed more verification. In order to find her son, we had to hire a private investigator, and it took time. But as you can see, we finally found Mr. Woolby. Please welcome Jason Woolby. Thank you, Jason. Yes, thank you. Good All right. Now, uh, Jason, did you see our first broadcast? Yes, I did. Well, I can't help but notice that in the recreation, we excluded you, and I assume that was our mistake. Yes, it was. I knew that. <laughs> but in lieu of that, how close was our depiction? It was very, very similar to the real thing. All right, in your own words, please, would you just tell us what happened that day? Sure. My mother had heard um, some information about Elvis being sighted in Kalamazoo. Yeah. And so the two of us decided to go down there and try to find out if there was any truth to that rumor. When we went there, we went to a local restaurant where we we had heard that Elvis had been reported sighted there. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, one of the patrons had made a suggestion that their Elvis Presley had been sighted at a renovated office building. So they suggested that you go there? Is that the idea? Correct. And what happened? When we went there, my mother went inside the office building and started to talk to a few of the tenants. Mm -hmm. And while we were talking to one of the tenants, um, this man entered the, entered the room and then demanded that we leave the tenants alone and that he escorted us outside. All right. Do you think that you saw, at that time, Elvis Presley? I really can't say for certain. What did the man look like? He had, he had glasses on with uh, grayish hair and a beard, and he was wearing some jean overalls. All right. Now tell us, how did it all end? All right. During the questioning, that my, was, my mother was asking him some real uh, serious questions concerning the, the Elvis Presley death. And he was starting to become real rude with answering the questions by just saying, nodding his head or just saying yes or no. Mm -hmm. And then after that, my mother just uh, walked out of the building. And that was the end of that? That was it. Well, as intriguing as this sighting was, there are only memories to authenticate it. But there have been other alleged encounters with Elvis Presley that have been documented. Phone calls, sightings, and even a recording session. And we'll tell you all about it when we return. But first, let's check our public opinion poll, and remember, in our last show, 79% of those people polled believe that Elvis Presley could be alive. Now, let's see if that percentage has changed over the past few months. How many of our callers tonight think that Elvis Presley could be alive? Whoa. All right, so far, unchanged. We'll be back in a moment. Is Elvis Presley alive? Our fourth sighting took place in June of 1989, near Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Carol Sheehan. On June 6, 1989, I saw Elvis Presley on a farm in Blount County, Alabama. 
Blount County is located northeast of Birmingham, Alabama. A rural area, it is an isolated location if someone wanted to disappear. Photographer Carol Sheehan was contacted by a friend who told her that Elvis Presley was in hiding on a local farm. Skeptical, Carol decided to see for herself. On June 6, 1989, I decided to take my son, Michael, out with me to the farm to find out exactly uh, for myself uh, if there really was Elvis uh, out there on the farm. I left Michael in the car with a two-way radio as my lookout, just in case uh, somebody came up that didn't want me there. I took my cameras, went, snuck up on the farm, found some bushes to hide into, and uh, got all ready. And there was a guy uh, walking on the farm uh, that looked so much like Elvis. So I started shooting pictures. up in a uh, car to talk with him for a while. Um, I managed to get one shot of that. Then Elvis turned and started to walk towards my area, and I panicked, and I got back in my car and took off. Uh, when I got back home, uh, I had my pictures developed. I was more or less pleased with what I had. A check of local property records found no Elvis Presley or John Burroughs residing in the area. The only validation for Carol's story are these photographs. To some, they are enough. I know it's been quite a while. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, we'll attend a recording session where Elvis Presley allegedly cut a record four years after he supposedly passed away. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Do you know who I am? Have you any idea who I am? I know it's been quite a while, and it's so good to see you again. Hi, the recording you've just heard has been presented as conclusive evidence that Elvis Presley did not die. And if the sound of the record isn't enough to convince you, listen to this. Wait a minute, man, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. Somebody, somebody just told me that, uh, that, that President Reagan and, uh, and some other people have been shot. I just like to. Uh, I just like to say that that I hope that uh, I hope they're not hurt badly. Yes, yes, there was an attempt made on President Reagan's life in March of 1981, four years after the alleged death of Elvis Presley. Now, some claim that this recording is proof that Elvis is alive, and the name of the singer is held up as further evidence. Civil Nora which is Elvis Aaron spelled backwards. Civil first appeared in 1981 and went way out of his way to maintain a low profile. A gentleman of the name by Stephen Chances was in contact with Civil Nora, and in 1981, responding to fan club pressure, Chances released a home video where the mysterious Civil actually appears and even sings. We have obtained a copy of this videotape, now, in order to protect Mr. Chance's privacy, we've obscured his face. Now, let's watch it. You, you can't please everybody all the time, and if it makes people happy to hear my voice and to know I'm living, then, then that makes me happy. Make sure I can just sing in tune. And if you think I don't need you, I'm so 
All right, I am curious, after watching that tape, how many of you in the audience believe that Sybil is really Elvis? May I see a show of hands, please? All right, interesting. Now, let's get back to the recording we heard earlier where Sybil stops a song and says that somebody just told him that President Reagan has been shot. I mean, it's just too convenient. Let's assume for a moment that Sybil is a hoax. Someone is trying to convince people that it really is Elvis Presley. Blurting out a reference about President Reagan is a pretty obvious way to imply Elvis is still alive. Still, there is little doubt, at least to the human ear, Sybil Nora sounds very much like Elvis Presley. But there is a way that we might be able to determine whether or not Elvis is making these tapes. Now first, let's listen to this. Dear Mr. President, first I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Elvis Presley. I admire you and have great respect for your office. I'm staying at the Washington Hotel under the name of John Burroughs. I will be here as long as it takes to get the credentials of a federal agent. Respectfully, Elvis Presley. All right, did it fool you? Well, Johnny Hera would fool just about anybody. But he would be hard-pressed to fool a voice print. So he decided to run a voice print test on the 1981 mystery tape. But before we show you the results of that test, I'd like to introduce you to our Elvis impersonator, Mr. Johnny Hera, please. <laughs> well, well, good, good, to see you. good to see you too, Johnny. All right, Johnny, welcome. Now, how long, how long have you been working as an Elvis impersonator? Since I was 11 years old. And how many years have you been doing it? About 35 years now, about 35 years. 35 years. Yes, sir. Well, looking at you, it's obvious that people could mistake you for Elvis. So. Have any of the Elvis sightings that you're aware of actually been you? Um, <clears throat> no, sir. The, um, I was mistaken for Elvis in, in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. I was on the, on the front page of the, of the Rocky Morning News um, in 1976. And the other time was here in, in Las Vegas when I was um, with one of my doctors here. No, uh, one? With one of, the, one of the doctors here. Yeah, one of the doctors. It was Elvis's doctor, if I remember correctly, um, that you, yes, were, you were seen with. Now, yes, that, a, that appeared in the papers? Uh, yes, sir. Did one of the tabloids? Uh, All right. I, I've heard it. Yes, sir. Let me ask you. Do you think that there's a possibility that Elvis Presley could still be alive? Well, very sad for for the fans and sad for for myself. Uh, no, sir. I don't. I don't think he's with us. All right, Johnny. Thank you very much for contributing this evening, ladies Thank and gentlemen. You. Johnny Hara. Thank you, Johnny. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we took the 1981 mystery tape to an audio analysis lab at the University of California at Los Angeles. We also gave the analyst, Dr. Peter Ladefoge, a known example of Elvis Presley's voice recorded at a press conference in 1970. This is what he discovered when he compared these two recordings. The first step in comparing two voices is to get tape recordings of a known and an unknown voice. Uh, here's a tape recording of the known voice of Elvis Presley taken from a press conference. And here are all the question tapes that we've been worrying about as to whether they are real or not. Uh, I want to go through them and find words that are the same on both. So I'm going to start with the Elvis Presley tape, put that Elvis Presley tape in, and we can play that back, and you'll hear part of this press conference. Uh, this is fantastic. You see, country music was always a part of... Uh... There was Elvis saying, you see, country music is always a part of... And this word always I'm particularly interested in. I happen to have got the word always as said by the unknown speaker. Uh, also recorded and in fact I cut out those two pieces of always from the two speakers and put them onto a computer and now let's play them back from the computer first the always out of that piece you've just heard and immediately following it the always uh, from the mystery tape there we go uh, Elvis and then the mystery tape 
And as you can see, they're forming patterns on the screen. Uh, and it's those patterns that I want to be able to examine. Here are the words always, as said by Elvis Presley, the known voice. And here is an always from one of the tapes which might or might not be Elvis Presley. You can see that there's a great deal of similarity. The patterns are the same in some senses here and there. This word is a bit more jawled out and a bit longer. But to me, there are noticeable differences. Typically, the higher up pieces up here uh, in the unknown voice don't match those uh, of the known voice of Elvis Presley. There are also small differences in the way in which the curvature of these bars showing the frequencies in his voice change from the real voice to the unknown voice, and they're all in slightly different positions. When I consider these tapes, I don't think any of them are Elvis Presley. If we think about that uh, voice on the mystery tape, that doesn't seem to be Elvis Presley, almost certainly. So all in all, all these voices strike me as very unlikely to be Elvis Presley. If Elvis Presley did not make this recording, then who did and why? Dr. Ladefoge believes, based on his scientific analysis, the voice in the 1981 mystery tape is not that of Elvis Presley. Science can also help us in another part of our investigation. When we come back, we're going to see for ourselves what Elvis Presley might look like today, a description that bears an uncanny resemblance to the mysterious John Burroughs. So hang in there. When we come back, the Elvis conspiracy is finally revealed. Could John Burroughs really be Elvis Presley? Welcome back to the Elvis conspiracy. Now, we have met people who are convinced that they did see Elvis Presley. If Elvis were alive today, he would be 57 years old. What would he look like? We decided to find out. We contacted Eugene O'Donnell, a graphic computer specialist who works for the FBI. Mr. O'Donnell helped develop a computer program that can take the common characteristics of aging and superimpose that process on existing features. He agreed to help us, and we supplied him with a photograph of Elvis as a young man. It took Mr. O'Donnell 16 hours of computer time to come up with the following composite. In this case, O'Donnell took a photograph of Elvis Presley as a young man and slowly aged him to the 57 years he would be today. Now, obviously, this enhancement doesn't take into account weight or surgical alteration, but O'Donnell's computer program can also anticipate hairstyles. For example, if Elvis Presley did indeed grow a beard, this is what he might look like. This is as close to a picture of the 57-year-old Elvis Presley as it is possible to get with computer enhancement. Now, throughout the program, we've been bringing you first-hand stories of Elvis sightings, and along with that, we've also described the mysterious events centering on a man known as John Burroughs. In a few minutes, we're going to take your phone calls, but first, let's take a look at our electronic map. So far, we have shown you four different sightings of a man resembling Elvis Presley. One was in Clyde, Ohio, at the Winesburg Inn. One was on a farm in Blunt County, Alabama. And two were in Michigan, in an office building in Kalamazoo, and a bar in Grand Blanc. These are our four documented Elvis sightings. Now, we're not saying that these people actually saw Elvis Presley, but we feel it's safe to say they saw someone matching his description. Now, we've also followed John Burroughs around the country through the credit report paper trail. Where Mr. Burroughs goes, Elvis sightings seem to follow. Our witnesses describe the man they saw as in his mid-50s, between six feet and six feet two inches in height, overweight, with graying dark hair. Some have reported that he has sideburns, others a beard. Again, there seems to be a pattern. In a number of places where people claim they have seen a man they believe to be Elvis Presley, a person by the name of John Burroughs has also been tracked. Just what is going on here? All right. Now, please forgive me, Monty, but I'm still a little confused. Does the, do the dates, rather, of the four Elvis sightings coincide at any point with the dates found along the John Burroughs paper trail? Oh, they certainly do. 
in every instance where an Elvis sighting was reported, there was also a request for credit history of John Burroughs. All right, I think I understand. Let's see if there's any questions from our viewers at home. Hello, we have a call from Tracy from Nashville. Hi, Tracy. Hello, Bill. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to tell y'all, back in 1990, I worked for a local police department. I was a dispatcher. And um, just by curiosity, I had ran Elvis Presley's name across the computer, which gives you his uh, driver's license number. Uh -huh. And I ran his driver's license number, and his driver's license came up valid. And if it is valid, I mean, if he's dead, then how come it's valid? All right. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Uh, now we have Carol Ann from Michigan, please. Hello, Carol Ann. Hello. Hi. Um, my question is that if Elvis has gone to such lengths to I'm hide, sorry. if Elvis yes. has gone to such lengths to hide his identity, why not leave the identity where it is now? Why do this? I think it's been provoked, really, simply because of the sightings. It keeps going on and on in the press, and it keeps coming up and up, and it would be a nice thing to solve. I think that's why it's going on, and hopefully it will end this evening. That would be very nice, too. We have Carlene from Brooklyn. Hello, Carlene. Hello, Bill. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I have a question for Monty? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I also have one for you, if it's all right. You worked with Elvis. Do you yes. think Elvis is stupid? Do I think Elvis was stupid? Right. No, I certainly don't. We had a wonderful time together. And uh, all I can tell you is the man had tremendous instincts. But stupid? No, he wasn't stupid. He was one of the most curious minds that I have ever known. You'll hear about that later, too. So what are we down to? That Elvis is alive and being seen all around the Midwest, or that Elvis is dead, and someone is staging these sightings to perpetuate a hoax for their own personal benefit. When we come back, we're going to talk with someone who should be able to throw some light on this curious chain of events, and that man is Joe Esposito, Elvis Presley's Army buddy, Chief of Staff, and Confident. So please stay with us. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, you'll have a chance to talk with Elvis's right-hand man, who is finally going to tell all he knows about the mysterious events of August 16, 1977. Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Now, before we meet our next guest, let's update our phone poll. How many of our United States callers believe that Elvis Presley could be alive? 75, 25. All right, very interesting. Joining us now is a man who should know more about Elvis Presley's state of mind in August of 1977 than anyone else. Joe Esposito. Joe, Joe. Now, Joe was Elvis's right-hand man, chief of staff, and confidant. Joe is currently writing his own book on his 17 years with Elvis Presley. It's called Elvis and the Memphis Mafia, and it'll be coming out pretty soon. Joe, welcome. Now, you have heard what we've said to this point. Who is John Burroughs, and what do you think is going on? Well, John Burroughs, to me, is just somebody that somebody made up this. Uh, it's like a big hoax. They knew Elvis's alias was John Burroughs, and uh, I think somebody's doing this for their own gain. All right, Joe, but we have a we have a 75 percent percentage of people here who believe that Elvis is still alive. So, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, uh, Elvis Presley is dead. He died on August 16, 1977. I'm sorry to say, I was there, and uh, that's all I can say. Did Elvis ever discuss a um, secret FBI sting operation with you? No, the first time I heard about that was on the show that you guys did a few, you know, last year. Uh, no, I never heard of any operation like that. All right, now, to the best of your knowledge, was Elvis Presley ever an undercover agent for, agent rather, for any law enforcement agency? No, uh, Elvis loved to be in law enforcement, but he was definitely not an agent for any law enforcement agency. All right, there are questions that I have from our first broadcast. Uh, as Elvis's road manager, you'd be in a position to know the answer to several of these questions. It was stated that there was an undercover agent in Elvis's band. Is that true? Well, as far as his immediate band, his rhythm section, no. I knew all those musicians for many years. They were definitely not undercover agencies. But he had an orchestra that traveled with him. Now, it's possible 
that there was one in that group, but for what reason? There's no reason to have an undercover agent. They never traveled with us anyhow. But there'd be none in the immediate group? Sure. No, absolutely not. All right. Now, some people have maintained that Elvis Presley flew out by helicopter uh, when he, uh, let's see, he flew out by helicopter into hiding when he allegedly died. Do you remember seeing a helicopter that day? Only after his announcement of his death, Bill. Uh, there was no helicopters flying over Graceland before that. Uh, it was all the press after it was announced that he's dead. But then when it was announced that... Helicopters helicopter. everywhere, yeah. All right, Joe, uh, now your version of events puts an end to any speculation that Elvis Presley might still be alive. And earlier you said that you'd be willing to take questions from our viewers at home. That's what I'm here for. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you, please, to be brief and stay on the subject, please. Our first phone call is Harold from somewhere, because I haven't been able to read that, from St. Louis. Hello, Harold. Yes, sir. Mr. Bixby, my yes, question is to you, if Elvis is still alive, whose body did they haul out of Graceland? Was it the maid or the butler? Good question. Good question. <laughs> a good question. Good question. <laughs> I, I have no idea whose body, if it was, in fact, a real body, which was implied uh, from our first show, that that may not have been. We have David from North Carolina. Hello, David. Hey, how are you doing, Mr. Bixby? Fine, thank you. Uh, my question to you is, uh, are you doing uh, this to prepare the world that Elvis is still alive so the world wouldn't be such a shock that when Elvis does uh, surface and come back? No, no, actually we're not. It was, that was suggested on our first show that uh, this was to prepare the way for Elvis. There's no intention on our behalf to try that. Uh, it just simply is we're trying to track down and get rid of... Um, you know, rumors. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, Becky from Houston. Hello, Becky. You know, it's an honor to talk to you, and uh, I've read where David Darlock is the one that is uh, on the tape impersonating uh, Elvis Presley, and I wish to just let him rest in peace. Yes, uh, I did a show uh, on Geraldo's show, uh, and he was on that show, and he is the one that stated he did that tape and he had a contract from a fan club that paid him $250 to make that tape just for them. And that is the voice on that tape. All right, Michelle from New York, please. Hello, Michelle. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Okay, my question is, um, I heard that Lisa Marie disappears two months out of every year and nobody knows where she goes. Is it true, and does she go to see him? Joe? Well, uh, I haven't heard of that story, and I don't know where you heard that one either, but uh, I don't think that's true, because uh, where's she going to go for those two months? Elvis is not here anymore. All right. Now, Joe, we have some people, rather, have charged that your version of the official story has changed over the years. There's ne there's never been an official story by me. Uh, I've given many interviews to many reporters, and what they interpret, I cannot tell you. It comes out different every time. All right. When we come back, our studio audience will have some questions for you, Joe, so please don't you go away, and don't you go away. I'll be here. So will I. When we come back, Joe Esposito will answer your questions on the controversy that won't go away. Is Elvis still alive? Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. All right, Joe, we appreciate you staying with us. Let me ask, please, why do you think people keep reporting that Elvis is alive? Well, because I think Elvis was loved by millions and millions of people, and, uh, and these people that are causing this hoax know that. And uh, to me, it gives a lot of false hope to them, and I hope uh, we can get straightened this out on this show. Well, in the summer of 1990, you appeared on another television show, and in a conversation about Elvis's biographer, Albert Goldman, you said, and I quote, uh, and that's how Elvis feels about the situation, the present tense. Why the present tense? Well, I probably said it in the present tense because I feel Elvis is with me all the time. Elvis is alive in my heart and he'll be there forever. And hope it is for everybody, too. All right. All right. I'm, I'm sure that many people here in the audience have some questions. Please, have we a question? Sir. Yes. Madam. Hi. My name's Wanda. I'm from Ohio. And I have a question that maybe you can put to rest. Elvis's daughter, Lisa, someone said or I had read that she was to inherit 
the main estate when she turned 21 or whatever the age was. 25. But, or 25, but that has since been changed to 30. Right. Is that correct? Yes, and it has. why would that be changed if... Because that's if, what Lisa wanted. She did not want to take the responsibility at the time when she turned 25, and she'd rather push it back to 30. And that's the way so she So this wanted. was at her own request? That was her own idea, yes. All right. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, sir? Yeah, hi. My name is Chris um, from L.A. in Vegas. Um, I was wondering, do you think the obsession with the death of Elvis is kind of significant of what's Could you happened? get closer to the mic, please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The, the obsession with the death of Elvis is characteristic of, like, the state of rock and roll at the moment. Um, I mean, I generally feel that Elvis would want us to listen to the music instead of all this, this concert going on about is he alive or not. Do you think um, this is a common trend, or do you, what are your comments on that? All right. Well, I just feel that, like I said earlier, Elvis was loved by so many people that hated to see him leave, and uh, that people keep bringing up this thing for their own gain. I have an idea who it is who's causing this hoax, but I can't say the name. But uh, I just want to make sure that Elvis, I mean, Elvis is not here. I'm sorry to say he's gone. He died. People have to understand that. Physically. Yes. what you're saying, he died. Yes. Hi, my name is Amy, and I'm from McHenry, Illinois. Could you speak up just a little, please? My name is Amy, and I'm Hi. from McHenry, Illinois. And my question is, is it true that Elvis's dead body weighed less than when he was alive? Well, uh, that, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. I wish I could. I, I don't know what, uh, how that works. Uh, I, he was heavy, yes, when he died, but I don't know what he weighed. All right. Yes. Please. Okay. Joe, you know Elvis had a twin brother that died at birth, and I was wondering, is there any possibility that that brother could be alive? No, that's uh, another whole story. Now, I mean, <laughs> no, he died at birth, ma'am. I'm sorry it was to say. At birth. Uh, yes, yeah, don't don't start that rumor, please. <laughs> oh dear. Oh. <laughs> yes, I, I can smell that one. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to know, uh, given the state of Elvis's health back in 1976, if he hadn't died, do you think he could have lived another 15 years? Good question. Well, uh, as far as being around Elvis and knowing how strong he was, I al we thought Elvis would live forever, and uh, what's not true. Uh, uh, but uh, he, yes, at that time I would say he probably lived on, but it, it happened so quick we didn't expect it. Yes, please. Hello. Being an Elvis fan, I'd like to believe that he was still alive, but I personally don't believe that, and I hope that the fans will listen to this. Um, Elvis was a man that had a lot of dignity, and if he was to hoax his own death, I don't believe that he would want the coroner's report to have shown all the drugs found in his body at the time of death. Thank you. Very true. Thank you. Yes. Do we have a question? I, do I have a question here? No, sir. I don't have a question. I have a question over here. Does anyone have a question? I'll sell you a question. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I have a question for you, Joe. What do you think Elvis would have made of this entire situation? Well, Elvis is probably up in heaven, I hope, at this time, laughing at all this. I uh, think it's a big joke. But then I think at other times, he'd probably be very upset because it gives hope to people that got to realize, let him rest. Let him rest in peace. He's gone. Yes. Now, like so many curious events surrounding the death of Elvis Presley, it all comes down to believers versus non-believers. But through all of these theories, something often gets left out, the kind of person that Elvis Presley really was. Was he the kind of person who could have done what some say he's done? Let's say for a moment, Elvis did fake his own death. He's changed his name, he's living a furtive lifestyle on the run, and yet He's finding the time to make phone calls, make records, and appear in some very unusual places. Could this man be Elvis Presley? When we come back, we're going to talk with someone who knew one side of Elvis better than anyone, and he believes he knows the answer. Joe, thank you very much for being here, and you stay with us. Thank you, Joe. With all of the controversy swirling around his life and his death, it's easy to lose sight of the private Elvis Presley. His life has been the subject of countless books and, and, and studies, but most of these works suffer from one thing. They don't reflect the real Elvis, the Elvis his closest friends and his family's members really knew. In 1964, our next guest started out working for Elvis in a humble capacity, his hairdresser. But soon Larry Geller became much more than that. He became a major influence on Elvis's life, 
and was with him until 1977. And this is Larry's story. Let's see, I met Elvis in February of 67. Now, that goes pretty far back. Yeah. But you go considerably farther back. Yes. I, here's, here, here's how it started. I, Elvis invited me up to his house in Bel Air 1964, early 1964 in April. Big house, too, I remember. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right over the golf course. Yes. And he was just finishing a film called Ralph's About, mm -hmm. and he wanted me to style his hair, which I did which led into a five-hour conversation about the meaning, the purpose of life. Elvis told me his life story, he told me about his mother, he, he cried. We got into so many areas, so many intimate areas. That it was just a night. natural, you just we, fell naturally we, in We just clicked. It yeah. was just something that happened. And that night changed both of our lives. He said, you know, Larry, listening to you talk, I, I always know, I've always known my whole life there was an unseen hand guiding my life. In fact, why? In fact, he went, he, he made this motion with his hand. He said, why was I plucked out of millions and millions of lives to be Elvis Presley? Why me? There's got to be a reason. So when he said that, I said, Elvis, I know some books. If you really want to get into this now, I know some books. Yeah. If you're willing to read, he said, willing to read? Yeah, man, listen, you got to work for me. Our lives changed that night. Because over the years, I gave him hundreds of books. From 1964 to 1977, Larry Geller and the books rarely left Elvis's side. Larry was with Elvis all the way until the end and remembers that despite health problems, Elvis Presley never lost his love of the spotlight. The point is, Elvis was plagued with physical ailments. He was a, ma he was a man that was dying. He didn't want to die, but he was dying slowly. His last performance was in June, June 26, 1977, about seven weeks before he died. Uh -huh. And he was so ill, he knew how he looked. In fact, he said that night, he said, I know what people must think, but I'll tell you, I'm going to look in my coffin. Are we talking omen here? It was a definite omen. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, when someone says something like that, and I suspected it, something in me knew that that was quite possible. It was dismissed. It was something that Elvis said. But he loved to perform. Bill, it was his, he said, Lisa Marie, my daughter, is the joy of my life. But performing... If you could only experience the joy, the rush of energy that I get on that stage, it's beyond anything I've ever experienced before. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Geller. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good to be here. Thank you. All right, welcome, please, Larry. You, you, you were among the few people allowed to remain by Elvis when he was in his casket. Yes. In fact, you, you actually, uh, you dressed him for the funeral, and you even dyed his hair black. Uh, at the risk of uh, seeming indelicate, was that really Elvis? Bill, as long as I live, I'll never forget August 16th, 1977. For that's the day Elvis died. And something deep inside of me just froze. It's like time stood still, and it's still with me. Elvis's father, Vernon, asked me to please go to the mortuary to work on Elvis's hair, prepare him for the funeral. So the next morning, very early, Charlie Hodge, who worked for Elvis, mm -hmm. and myself walked into the room at the mortuary, and there was Elvis lying on a table with a sheet covered right up, right up to right here. Yes. It was, it was overwhelming to, to look at him. And I noticed right away, that he, see Elvis really had white hair, mm -hmm. and I dyed it black every three or four weeks. He had a regrowth of about an inch to an inch and a half of white hair all over his sideburns, all over his hair. I wasn't prepared for it. So very quickly, there was a female attendant, and I asked her if she had any mascara. Fortunately, she had black mascara. So I took that little brush out and I blended it into his hair. Into his hairline. Yeah. Made it look as natural as possible. Proceeded to work on his hair. And to top everything off, the two other attendants that were getting him ready 
remove the sheet entiring and uh, exposing his entire body he's laying there with incision marks from the autopsy crisscrossing his torso bill you know me i have worked on elvis for over 14 years thousands of times if you only knew how much i wish he was with us right here right now i know you do but that was elvis that was Elvis. All right, let me ask you something. Uh, how seriously, I'm just changing the subject for a moment. Okay. How seriously did Elvis take law enforcement? The FBI, bomb squads, local police, his own security force, which was a real good one, mm -hmm. protected his life, our life, his family's life, the fans' life. Mm -hmm. He had a deep admiration, a deep respect. And so he collected badges. He was a marshal. Of respect for law enforcement. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In a very major way, because he knew the importance. And you were saying that he, he I'm sorry, I interrupted you. He was collecting well, badges. Well, he, he collected badges. Uh, he was an honorary marshal. He was an honorary sheriff, DEA agent. Mm -hmm. He was an honorary uh, police commissioner. But he was honorary. That's it. End of story. Now, why do you think so many people believe that Elvis is still alive? Elvis is the biggest star that ever happened. He, th there'll never be another Elvis. He made such an impact upon people's lives. His energy is still rippling around this planet. It's going to go on and it will never stop. And. To, to really understand this phenomenon, we have to understand that in a spiritual sense, he's still alive. What do you mean by the spiritual sense? Michael Landon, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, you, me, everyone that's listening to us right now, they're going to go through that doorway of death. Death is not the end it's a doorway to a new beginning to uh, to the to the natural eternalness of our soul that's what life is all about this is the this is the fact of existence elvis went through that door he didn't die he went through the door he went on elvis went on it's like we're all going to go on so in a very special sense elvis lives on in his music in his films, in our memories, but most importantly, the connection is in our heart. Elvis is still with us. All right. At the beginning of this broadcast, we said that we would have some answers for you about whether or not Elvis Presley is alive. And it all comes down to who and what you believe. For a believer, there isn't any explanation required, and for the skeptic, there isn't any explanation possible. We'll be right back. The Elvis Conspiracy will be back in a moment. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. Throughout the course of this broadcast, we've been conducting a phone poll, logging callers from around the United States on whether or not they believe Elvis Presley could still be alive. Now let's see our final talent. Seventy thirty. It has changed a little, but not that much. Now I'm curious, after all that you've seen this evening, how many of you in our audience think that Elvis Presley could still be alive? May I see some hands? And those that believe he has passed on? All right, thank you. Now, last August, when I first appeared before you, I mentioned the importance of having an open mind. And through these two broadcasts, I've tried to keep an open mind myself. But in my personal opinion, I believe, sadly, that Elvis did pass away on August 16th, 1977. I also believe that in a very special, sublime sense, Elvis Presley will never die. And he'll be alive as long as people love him and cherish his memory. I'm Bill Bixby. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
beautiful fact of a great job. mother finds courage and friendship amid ghetto despair in the stirring drama The Women of Brewster Play, starring Oprah Winfrey, tonight at 9. What do Kenny Rogers, Willie Nelson, and Jenny Jones all have in common? They'll be at the People's Choice Awards this Tuesday night at 9, right here on CFCF 12. That 